So I'm just going to start the recording. There we go. Now, um, airmanship is an interesting one because um, it's a it's a bit of an ethereal thing. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by defining what airmanship is. And this is a, a really kind of key piece because we need to really have a clear picture as to you know what we're we're talking about here when we talk in terms of airmanship. Um, there we go. Cool. All right. Um, then we're going to look at and describe daily inspection and walk around, and we'll look at some SAC standard signals, and we'll uh, also recite various checklists, uh, which are a big part of airmanship. So to start with, I would like to ask you this. And um, what I'd like you to do is use the question box and type in, what does airmanship mean to you? Did we just lose everyone? There we go. No, we're still there. Cool. All right, so using your question box. Ah, beautiful. I'm seeing the questions come in, or the answers come in. Sorry, I just had a moment of panic where my uh, control panel disappeared and I thought I'd shut down the webinar. So I'm going to give it a few moments to let a few people answer. I'm getting some really good um, answers in here. Okay, so uh, some of the answers we're getting. Uh, rules of the road. Um, a set of best practices. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, <laughs> just Google it. <laughs> I'm, I've already done that. All right. Um, uh, the ability to fly the airplane. Love that one. Skills and flying proficiency. Uh, rules. Um, adaptive. Ooh, I like that one from Chris. Um, Knowledge of aviation procedures that apply, yes, absolutely. Uh, fly well and make good decisions. And um, thanks, Neil. That's a, a really good one. Fly well and make good decisions. We're actually going to uh, we're going to talk a little bit about decision making today. Um, but because decision making is such a key thing, we actually have an entire module uh, just dedicated to decision making. Um, uh, Karen upkeep from Karen as well, absolutely. Now. Airmanship is kind of one of those things where we all need it, we, we practice it, we talk about it, but you know, do we really um, have a good description of what it is? So I did that. I Googled it. And here's what, what popped up for me, and this is out of Wikipedia. Um, airmanship is skill and knowledge applied to aerial aviation. And this is, this is from a book. Um, I forgot to make the citation. Apologies. But basically, it's the um, <clears throat> the skills and the knowledge, and then we apply it. And really, to me, the application of this is what makes airmanship airmanship. So we've been talking about theory of flight last week, which is which is knowledge. Um, we've alluded to some of the skills, and really, it's around the application of those. Now. Um, the description continues on, airmanship covers a broad range of desirable behaviors and abilities. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, this is how we behave as well as how we are, are capable as an aviator. Um, it is not a simple measure of skill or technique, but also a measure of the pilot's awareness of the aircraft, the environment that it operates within, as well as their own capabilities. Now, um, the image that I that I selected to put with this slide is actually uh, a screenshot from the most watched aviation accident video of all time. It's the United Airlines DC-10 um, flight 232 when it, it it arrived in Sioux City, Iowa. And the reason I put this in here is because it's cited as actually one of the greatest examples of good airmanship. And I thought there was some good ir irony here because, you know, here we're talking about airmanship, and meanwhile we've got a, a great fiery crash. But when we look at the circumstances of that flight, um, they had a complete hydraulic failure in flight when the number two engine 
had a compressor failure. <clears throat> and while they're in the air, they had to figure out how to fly an airplane with no controls. And not only did he manage to fly the plane, but he managed to maneuver it and get it to the airport and um, to quite a spectacular arrival. But uh, it was his, uh, the pilot's, excellent airmanship in this scenario that <clears throat> actually got them to a state where they could arrive, albeit um, at quite a spectacular arrival. Um, but they could arrive, and the majority of the people on board actually um, survived. So what we're going to do for this this section, normally I, I play a few videos and, and we discuss them, but um, unfortunately my webinar software is a little bit challenging from the, the video playback perspective. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a quick link. Um, oh, where are they? There they are. Cool. All right, so I'm going to send you some so a, a quick link. We're going to pause for a minute, and we're going to watch um, the video. Okay, so if you just go into your text box. There we go. I have just sent a link to everyone of the, um, of the uh, video. Sorry, Karen's got her hand up. Karen? Uh. Oh, I, I couldn't uh, get on earlier when you asked the question, so it, it's back now. You're good? Okay. Yeah, now I am. That was a while ago. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so <clears throat> I've just sent the, the link to everyone, and what I'd like you to do is um, just pop into a second window, uh, copy and paste that link that I've, I've sent through the, the questions box, um, and when you come back from the link, uh, having watched it, it's about a, a one-minute video, uh, just, just raise your hand so that I know that people are, are coming back. Does that sound good? So we've got about four or five hands popping up that they're done. Just going to give it a few more moments. <clears throat> Okay. Just the one video at the moment, Chris. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to bring everyone's hand down. Now, um, using your question box, I want to just I want you to just type in what you observe from that. Um, 
The video is actually labeled an F-16 bird strike. It's actually not an F-16. It's a Goshawk, which is a single engine uh, two-seat trainer. This happened out west, um, the Canadian Air Force's jet. And I just want you to type in your observations of the video in the context of um, airmanship. So just go ahead and spend a few moments to reflect on that and type in what your thoughts were. Okay. Okay, so want to take a, a quick discussion around this. Now, here's some of the things that, that we're looking at. And basically what happened was there was a bird strike. So they're flying along, single-engine airplane, they ingest a bird, and they lose the only engine that they have. Now, what, what strikes me with this video, and a few of you have commented on this, um, is first of all is how calm the pilots remain in this scenario. Um, you can hear at the very beginning when, when they first hit the bird, there's a, there's a, a sort of suppressed, oh, oh crap. Um, but it's definitely very much business as usual. It's like, okay, we've lost the engine. And um, there's uh, a really good communication between the two pilots as well as between air traffic control. So you hear the one pilot talk to the other pilot, and he says, okay, I'm going to fly the plane. You try to restart the engine. Um, so right at the beginning, we're already getting into some cockpit resource management. We're getting into some, you know, who's going to take care of what, um, assigning roles and tasks and being very clear as to who's, to, who's doing what. Um, the number one f objective here, the focus is fly the airplane. Uh, so you have aviate, navigate, <clears throat> and then finally communicate. And you notice he does one quick call to air traffic control to say, you know, we're ejecting to the north. We've had an, uh, an engine failure. Um, you also notice that the, air, the aircraft is maneuvered to a safe position before they eject. And, you know, it's, it's a really great example in my mind of, of airmanship because it's very much how, um, how well these two gentlemen deal with the situation. Um, you know, keeping, keeping under control, keeping the aircraft under control, um, as well as, you know, making sure that we've got the right, uh, you know, all of, all of our ducks in a row and, and things taken care of, etc. Okay, so we're going to watch two more videos. Um, the next one is a, is a very famous scenario. It's the, the, um, the uh, <clears throat> miracle on the Hudson. So I'm going to again send this to everyone. And again, I want you to listen to the, um, not only the demeanor, but also what are some of the things that were said. Okay, so you should all have that now. Karen, you had your hand up. You doing okay? No, I don't even have the other one yet. Okay, so let's just I pop it. Did you get the second one that I just sent? That's what I mean. I haven't got the second one yet. It should be in your question box. Yeah, I have the first one. Oh, sorry. oh there it is. Oh. Now, I, this is embarrassing. I copied it, but I don't know where to, un, where to look at it. To, um, paste, oh, to paste it. Open a, a browser window. Uh, and then paste it into the into the URL, and it should start right away. 
copy it. I've copied it now. Where do I go? Like, this is just oh, this open is up. <laughs> oh, go go to the internet. Just oh, open a new internet right. window. Okay. And then paste the URL in the top there where it says HTTP colon slash slash. Okay. Oh, okay. I see. Got okay. it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Cool. So check back with us in a few moments when you're good. Okay. Thanks. So once again, as, as this is finishing, raise your hands. So as, as the video finishes, just raise your hands. I'm seeing a few hands starting to go up. Okay, a bunch of hands are going up there. <clears throat> so again, um, taking a look at this, um, we see a very professional approach. We see very much a um, scenario where people obviously have their plan. They've thought this through. Um, we also see some good use of, again, the cockpit resource management piece. Um, he reaches out to the air traffic controllers to for assistance. So, not flying um, airliners in a in a air traffic control environment. As a glider pilot, who could we reach out to for assistance? So, within your within your question box, I want you to just pop in there and type in some of the people or organizations that you could reach out to for assistance should you find yourself in a difficult situation. So Dane saying ground control, absolutely. And, and ground control can actually take the form of, um, <clears throat> of you know, actual air traffic controllers <coughs> or even just the, the ground station at your, at your local glider club. Uh, from Pavel, other pilots, absolutely. Um, other gliders in the air, uh, your base control. Um, you could even use your cell phone for 911. Now we want to be cautious of that, that we want to make sure that we're uh, flying the airplane and, and not getting distracted. Um, other aircraft, who else could we reach out to for assistance? Should we be running into some difficulty? Or, the, or someone else that we could rely on? 
let's consider the scenario we're preparing to launch. We haven't started rolling down the runway yet. Who could we, we look out to for assistance? The ground crew, absolutely. Um, think about your wing runner. <clears throat> Part of their job should be to be aware and be cognizant and, and, and vigilant to see that your aircraft is properly configured, um, that the tail wheel has been removed, that the, um, the canopy is closed and locked, the spoilers are closed and locked. So something that we have done, um, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> something we've started doing within our club this year is the uh, wing runner now does a uh, quick check to say, you know, spoilers closed and locked, canopy closed and locked, tail dolly off um, just before launch. And they're now part of the launch crew, right? So as, as Chris said, the wing runner. Uh, the tow plane's another one. So if you've taken off and, and things aren't quite working out right, um, you know, you can always call the tow plane on, on the radio and say, hey, you know what? Um, I know I was only going to 2,000 feet. I want to go to four because I got something weird happening with my airplane here and I want, I want the extra height. Or can you, know, can you swing around and, and get me back closer to the runway? You know, things like that. So as much as we're in the cockpit alone, um, we're not in the sky alone. Um, and I think that's an important piece when we talk in terms of uh, cockpit resource management and, and you know, considering... Uh, what resources we do have and how we could, um, um, you know, leverage some of those resources. And, you know, remaining calm is, is very, very key because, you know, getting panicky is not going to do anyone any good. All right. So we've got our, our final in our, in our series of videos here. Um, so I'm just going to send that out to everyone. Send to all. There we go. And uh, this one... You only need to watch about the first half. You'll know when to stop, because <laughs> the the second half of the video is is actually just the okay the 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 the, the thing has happened and and then they just kind of standing around scratching their heads. All right, so uh, I'm going to get you to go ahead and watch that one again. Raise your hand when you're done, and then um, as we did before, we're going to reflect and comment on um, what's what happened there.
So starting to see some hands popping up, which is a good sign. Um, as you finished watching it, please pop into the question box and put your comments in. <clears throat> Okay, so um, the interesting thing with this is we had a licensed pilot with an instructor. Uh, from what I understand is um, the one was, one was, um, uh, they're flying in, in the French Alps, and one was uh, getting basically a check flight by the instructor. And um, this one kind of cracks me up because at about the 30-second point, you hear the gear warning light come on, or the gear warning horn come on. And it just keeps blaring away until they finally touch down. Um, <coughs> so the comments here is they both ignored the warning. Um, is not clear to me, did he forget to lower the landing gear despite the noise? And Svetfan, that's exactly what happened. Um, no, it was actually a, they, they just simply didn't notice it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, Gary's commenting about how the French love to wear their sweaters around their necks. Um, they did both stay pretty calm, but unfortunately, when we talk in terms of um, good uh, airmanship, it's not only having the good skills, remaining calm under pressure, those sorts of things, but also having that level of awareness. So after looking at two of them, um, you know, here we have the scenario where the... Um, you know, we look at the, the desired behaviors and abilities, but also, uh, you know, the pilot's awareness. You know, we, when we look at, let me switch to there, pen, there we go, um, the pilot's awareness. So there's definitely, in this last video, there was a lack of awareness that was, that was going on. Um, <clears throat> and it, you're right, I, I don't see anything that was communicating between the two of them, that it was um, hard to... Uh, or see any communication regarding any concern. Um, and no, you can't hear the conversation. But unfortunately, um, you know, they had headsets on, they're able to communicate to each other. And I think the, the look that they give each other right after they stopped is, is very much telling. Here they have a situation where, um, despite the warning, that was that was clanging away there. They they continued the flight down and and did a nice landing. Um, just you know, yeah, didn't have the undercarriage down. Now, all of this <coughs> is kind of building on a concept that that's really um, gaining a lot of popularity in the private general aviation world, which is scenario based training and scenario reflection. Um, there's a, a brilliant study done out of the University of Otago in New Zealand, and um, what they found was if you ask pilots these five questions um, when you're given a scenario, it greatly increases your, um, your ability to you know, not only learn but also make better decisions. So I'm just going to walk through these very quickly. First, briefly list the pilot's actions leading up to and during the incident. So we think about the last video and the pilot's actions. Well, um, one of their actions was to either ignore the um, stall or the, the, the warning indicator, or maybe they just didn't hear it. Um, you know, they executed a very nicely flown circuit and approach. Um, you know, so we kind of look at that. You know, what were the reasons or the cause for each of the actions that took place? <coughs> Excuse me. You know, the it could be that they didn't hear the stall warning. Um, perhaps their headsets weren't, you know, it wasn't piped in through the headset. It was just, you know, an audible alarm that was outside in the, in the ambient noise of the aircraft. Um, you know, we'd have to, you know, find out a little bit more from each of them, of course. But you think about the, the reasons. Now, 
thinking of other reasons or causes for each of those actions. Perhaps they were distracted. Um, this could be one of those situations where they uh, maybe they didn't run their checklist. I didn't, I didn't see any evidence of a checklist being run. Um, you know, perhaps there is some complacency there. Uh, the aircraft they're flying is a little bit of a higher end airplane. Um, so perhaps they felt they, they knew all the pieces there and, and could get that done. Or the actions appropriate, did they contribute to the outcome? Um, the lack of a checklist did contribute to the outcome um, in that they, you know, set up the airplane and, and brought it in for landing with the gear up. Um, however, you look at some of the other actions, they did fly a good stabilized approach, uh, which means that when they did eventually land, <coughs> they did land uh, in a very um, controlled approach, so, you know, minimize the amount of damage that was done. Um, what would you have done if you had been the pilot? And now we get to the armchair quarterback um, question. And this is the whole, you know, reflecting back on, on you know, how you would approach it. Um, and then are there any guidelines or principles that you could apply to similar situations in the future? And I think Kevin's comment of checklist, exclamation mark, is, is really kind of bang on there. So we take a look at that and consider, um, you know, what are some of the guidelines and principles? Well, one is absolutely checklist. The other is uh, definitely being very cognizant and clear as to who is flying the airplane, who's making the decisions and things like that. Um, one of the scenarios that can develop in this in this uh, area is um, for the pilot uh, deferring to the instructor, um, you know, is it very clear that the pilot is actually flying the plane versus the instructor uh, is just observing? And this is a, a very serious issue that we've actually seen within, um, not, not this club, but there was a club that uh, many of our members came from where um, an airplane was actually landed, a glider landed, with no one at the controls because the instructor thought the, the student was flying and the student thought the instructor was flying. And, um, you know, we want to be very clear on these as to who's doing what and uh, making sure that there's good, clear communications and this is the reasons for the whole you have control, I have control, um, handoff. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry, Kevin made a, a nice comment here. Provide opportunity for students to recognize the problem, then take over. <coughs> Absolutely. So we want to make sure that we are, you know, giving students that opportunity, um, but we're also making sure that we're, We've got our airplane, you know, well configured and, and prepared for, um, you know, the arrival. So some, some kind of interesting way of approaching this, and we're going to be revisiting this um, as we go uh, through our other decision-making module. But these questions are actually really good to pose to yourselves, um, especially if you like to watch the, you know, the various aviation videos and kind of see what, what happens and, you know, what, what can go wrong, et cetera. So I'm going to just kind of, yeah, perfect, okay. Um, the airmanship mantra is use your superior judgment so you don't have to use your superior skill. Now, as pilots, we love to exchange stories and tell, tell the great story about how we saved the day, but really at the end of the day, uh, we'd like a nice boring flight. So good airmanship is all about using your superior judgment so you don't have to use your superior skill. <clears throat> And part of that is around doing our daily walk-arounds and inspections. Um, so we think about if we've rigged our airplane that morning, um, or even if the airplane's already been rigged and we're just doing our, our daily inspection, making sure that all the parts are connected, everything's been put together correctly. Um, this past summer, doing the annual safety reports, we had, I think it was three or four incidences where aircraft were not rigged correctly and then flown. <coughs> um, one of which was um, the aircraft was actually flown without its main pin, uh, which and that's the pin that holds the wings in, uh, without that one being secured. It was, it was not installed. 
Um, two others were the um, total energy port was not installed, and you know the aircraft is flown. Um, and that one actually, they did several flights before that was noticed. Um, the worst of which, however, um, was there was actually a glider that attempted to take off with its elevator disconnected. And this this incident, um, normally you're talking two fatalities because uh, you're talking about the glider pilot and then the, the tow pilot. Fortunately, through some very quick thinking and reactions based on the glider pilot, um, he released the glider quickly enough that it, it the tow plane didn't get flipped over. It, it broke the tow plane because uh, it stood it up on its nose and then slammed it down on its tail. Um, and he managed to use the flaps of his airplane to control the pitch to a, to a safe landing. But we look at that in the context of the mantra that we just talked about, using our superior judgment to <coughs> <coughs> avoid having to use our superior skill. And this is why daily inspections and walk-arounds and positive control checks and critical assembly checks and everything are so, so important. Um, I know any time I fly an aircraft that I've just rigged, um, I always get a second pair of eyes to come over and do a quick check. I always do that positive control check. And, you know, it doesn't take a very long time to do. Um, but if we don't do these things, it can, it can really, you know, lead to a bad result. So, you know, when we're looking at um, the whole concept of airmanship, it's about making sure that your aircraft is put together correctly, you're put together correctly for the day. So hence, <coughs> if this was a flying day, I wouldn't be flying because um, of my cold. But it, um, you know, is the aircraft ready? Are you ready? Uh, do we have all of that um, in place? And just going to do a very quick review of the, the standard si signals. Um, most importantly, from the wing runner's perspective, you know, the take up slack, where we're swinging below, you know, just the, the kind of the bottom half here, um, versus the all out signal where we do the full circle round. And putting your hands up to signal stop. <coughs> And your two key signals once you're in flight um, by the tow plane, the first is rocking the wings, and this is the immediate release. And that's very, very key, the word immediate. Um, that means there's something wrong with the tow plane, and you need to release right away. Now, you look at this and ask yourself, is he rocking his wings, or is he just hitting some turbulence? And the quick, easy way to determine that is just look at his ailerons. Because if he's rocking his wings, you're going to see those ailerons flipping from side to side, going up and down um, as he goes. Now, the rudder waggle, um, <clears throat> this is just the rudder from side to side, and the aircraft stays relatively flat. Now, yes, there is secondary effective controls here, and you'll see a little bit of a, a, a thing. But it's pretty straightforward and, and easy to see. This is check your dive brakes. And a number of years ago in the United States, they decided to test this signal. And they, they got tow pilots to give a rudder waggle. And they found something like 80% of pilots were pulling the release. So you want to be very clear and correct <coughs> on what your signals are. <clears throat> know them and make sure that the, the people at both ends of the rope know them well. So we're going to take our break here. <coughs> um, let's do a 10 minute break today. And uh, we'll come back in about 10 minutes. And I'm just gonna change my screen. Show, oops, sorry. Show, there we go. So we'll see everyone back here in about 10 minutes.
And we're back. Okay. Um, so welcome back. Uh, if anyone has any questions or thoughts that they want to just uh, chime in uh, as we get restarted here, just raise your hands. Okay. <clears throat> so um, just to, to kind of bring us back into this, I wanted to um, introduce you to the Soaring uh, Safety Foundation <clears throat> and their website. And um, this is uh, part of the uh, Soaring Society of America. Um, and what they've done actually is they've, they've put together some really nice um, videos here leveraging um, a Condor Trainer. And I just wanted to walk through a couple of them very quickly with you. Um, the first is the, the stall spin turn to final. And um, <clears throat> what they've done is they've, they've leveraged the um, Condor trainer's ability to kind of run the scenario. And one of the nice things with it is it, is it does give very realistic flight scenarios. So we'll take a look at this one here. And... Um, here we're setting up on base, turning to final. Now, one of the things that you'll notice with this is we're not getting the proper bank angle here. So we continue that around, and you can see the, the yaw string is way off to the side. So what's happening is he's you know over ruttering the turn. There's the wing drop in and the the um, the stall spin. So here's the view from the outside as we play back the same flight. So again, shallow bank angle on the turn, airspeed's dropping, you can see the rudder being kicked in there. <clears throat> you know, miss the turn to final. So kicking a bunch of rudder to get the aircraft lined up. And there's the, the rotation. And you can actually even see um, he's putting right aileron in to try and, and uh, prevent that. <clears throat> oh yes, and <coughs> this is what it looks like from the ground if you're watching this, this coming into the approach. You can see the airplane rotating um, as he kicks too much rudder and then, and I mean, it's not even a half a turn and, and uh, yeah, okay. This is another really good one, and I really like this one because it shows just how fast um, how fast things can develop. So we're bugging along, and there's the the kite up. Okay, so it's it's only a few seconds. So there, the glider's lifted off, and it starts to climb and 1001, 1002, about two to three seconds and you have, um, you know, out climbed the tow plane and, and flipped it up on its nose. <clears throat> okay. And uh, the next one that I wanted to, yeah. So the next one I wanted to just take a quick look at is um, the premature rope break and the whole concept of you can't always make it back. So here we are, we're in our takeoff, we're starting our climb out. And there's the rope release. Now, um, Yeah, perfect. So we let this play out, and we think, well, the standard thing is to do the U-turn back. But do you notice as he's starting his turn, look at where he is over the runway. So we're making that turn. And now we've actually positioned ourselves in here. <clears throat> Again, it, it develops into the stall spin in this, in this scenario. Um, 
but if we rewind just a little tiny bit here, you know, trying to make this turn here, he's actually now positioned himself in a very bad spot where he's off to the side of the runway, uh, midfield, really, you know, kind of running out of options. Now, if we take a look at this again, um, and let's take the, the cockpit view this time. Uh, where's the cockpit view? Here it is. So we're trying to get turned around and lined back on that runway, and you can see you're just in a very bad position for that. So when we, there we are, this is a good view from it. Um, you notice how much runway is out in front. And when we lose that toe, right there, you've got some good options straight ahead of you. So, you know, getting the U-turn, turning back isn't always the best case scenario. Um, but I do encourage you to take a look at the Soaring Safety uh, Foundation's website. Um, and what they have is they have a number of different videos that, that walk you through um, the different scenarios, such as, you know, ground loop on launch and, you know, things like that. Um, and they're very well produced videos, so I do encourage you to, you know, take a look at those. Okay, so let's get back to our, our regularly scheduled program. So the next piece we're going to talk a little bit about is weight and balance. And in weight and balance, um, it's really about making sure that your aircraft is properly prepared for its flight. So is there the proper amount of weight in the nose? Um, it's not too tail heavy, it's not too nose heavy, you know, those sort of factors. <clears throat> now, and this is a, a question you will most likely get on the exam. You have to run the numbers for the weight and balance. And the way this works is we take the actual weight in question. So in this case, uh, let's, let's run this second line here. Um, the 130 pound pilot, I think that must be Jim Miller. And the arm, which is how far away from the datum it is, in this case it's 70. So we multiply those together and we get a moment arm of, of 191, or, or sorry, 9,100. Now, um, the aircraft has its um, limits. So we take a look at this aircraft here, and we've got a 700-pound gross weight airplane with a CFG limit from 90 to 96 inches aft of datum. So this arm here is inches aft of datum. Now, the question that we have for you is, is this airplane within its weight and balance? How would we go about um, doing this? Now, so the arm, Dane, is, um, there's, there's a reference point on the airplane, typically, usually the nose of the airplane, and then we measure the weights, like how far back, and what we're looking for here is the amount of um, the twisting moment. So if you think about when you use a crowbar, the longer the crowbar, the easier it is for you to pry something. So you need less weight at the end of that crowbar to create that twisting moment. <coughs> so... The question here is, how do we calculate this number? Now, if we know that I take 130 and I multiply it by 170 to get this number, given that I have this number and I have this number, how would I calculate this number? So just pop into your question box and type in what your answer would be. I'm not looking for the actual numbers, it's just how do we do the calculation. Anyone, anyone, Bueller? Absolutely. So the correct answer is we divide. <clears throat> so the weight and the arm, which is the position of the weight, is uh, you multiply those two together and you get the moment arm, which is what they refer to as the inches and pounds. 
So for this particular airplane, the pilot is set 70 inches back aft of datum at 130 pounds. We, we calculate that. We add these numbers up here. So when we go down this way, we're actually adding. Okay. Um, we add these numbers up here. And then to get this number here, we divide 645. We divide 159, 150 by 645. And if you have your calculators handy, that comes out to 91.705, which means we're actually close to the forward C of G limit at 90 um, versus the aft limit at 96. So this airplane is actually safe to fly, and we could we could uh, we could go ahead and do that. And this is actually a weight and balance table for a Schweitzer 126. Um, Basically, you need to know what the weight and balances are. Now, for most airplanes, what they do is they run the numbers and say you need a minimum of X amount of weight in the cockpit, maximum of X amount of weight in the cockpit. And then as long as you're between those two, two limits, you're good to go. Um, you also need to take into consideration things like if you're carrying ballast or not. So in the Jantar, <coughs> as a 210-pound pilot, can I carry, um, you know, ballast or not? Do I have enough uh, extra weight there? Um, considering, you know, the 210 pounds piece, so if I drop 220 or two, 210 pounds in here instead, right? Now, I add that up, and I've got 710 and um, 725 with my parachute. <laughs> So I'm actually at a gross weight of 725. So for this particular airplane, um, I would not be able to fly it because I'm above the gross weight. So you know you can you start to look at those and think about what does that look like for your airplane. Now density altitude. Love this picture. Um, wanted to just get you to pop into the question box there and describe for me what you think density altitude is. So why don't you just pop in there and, and let's, let's see what you guys think about density altitude. And if you don't know, that's totally fine. So what is density altitude? Getting some good answers here. Let's get a few more moments. Okay, <clears throat> so density altitude um, is the effective altitude of the air based on a couple of factors. And you guys are all hitting right around at the whole thing that, that you're, you're getting absolutely cracked. As we go higher up, the air gets thinner, right? So density altitude is all about how dense is that air, hence how, how thin is it, how high does the airplane think it is, right? So density altitude determines the actual altimeter reading, kind of, it does. Um, density altitude is really how much, what, what effective altitude does the airplane think it's at based on standard atmosphere. So um, as you're all correctly saying, you know, the higher we go, the, the thinner the air gets. Now, what ends up happening is, yes, temperature does come into play here. So we take into account a couple of factors. We take into account um, air pressure. <coughs> we take into account air temperature, and we take into account humidity. Now, the reason we take humidity into account is that um, 
water molecules in the air, so hence when it's very humid, displace air molecules, um, and they're actually thinner than, than uh, air molecules are, which surprised me. Um, and I want you to think about on that, that stinking hot, humid summer day, and it's almost hard to breathe, and the air feels like it's thin. And what you're actually doing there is you're experiencing density altitude, experiencing a high density altitude. Now, when air war gets warmer, um, the molecules within the air excite and they move around and they tend to spread out a little bit, so hence the density gets a little bit lower. And then we put some humidity in there which displaces some of the air molecules and hence it gets a little bit thinner again. And um, and then the pressure drops, you know, because we have a low pressure in the area, or a, or a high pressure in the area. Um, then what happens is we get that, that sort of thin air effect. Now, the aircraft's wings react and the aircraft's engines, they, they both react to how thick that air is. So hence, when you are doing a takeoff at sea level, you're going to use less runway, you're going to accelerate faster, and you're going you're to climb faster. The higher that you get, um, the, the slower the climb, the less effective your engines, etc. And when you're on a large, when you're on a runway, trying to accelerate and then hence take off, that difference can cause um, a perception by the airplane that it's actually a couple thousand feet higher than it actually is. But it's going to behave based on, you know, what the air is thinking or what the air is feeling like. So, you know, when you, even though you may be 820 feet above sea level at, at Great Lakes, on those hot days when the air is really humid and, and you know, the pressure is, is kind of a little bit lower, um, it's going to feel thinner and it's going to take longer for the airplane to roll down the runway. It's going to take longer for it to accelerate. And these are the days when we're taking off and, and, you know, just getting above the trees at the far end of the runway versus on those cooler days where things, you know, climb and, and, and take off uh, much sooner and quicker. So when you start your flying season this coming year, <clears throat> in the spring when it's still relatively cool out, um, pay attention to how quickly that glider and that tow plane are, are taking off, how, how quickly they're breaking ground, how quickly they're climbing, where they are at the end of the runway. Um, and then, you know, think about that again mid-summer and, you know, sort of just pay attention to that and you'll notice that density altitude is, is going to play a factor. So it's definitely something that we need to be aware of. Um, in our world as glider pilots, we don't do the calculations, but the airliners, they do. And they figure out how much, you know, they need and whether they're going to make it off the end of the runway or not. Okay. So we're going to spend the rest of our time um, <clears throat> covering off some important um, uh, laws, some minimums, and then we'll, we'll just finish out with our, our checklist. So VFR... As glider pilots, we fly only VFR in Canada. So we need to uh, know these numbers. Um, in control zones and aerodrome uh, traffic zones, we need to have not less than three miles visibility, horizontally one mile, vertically uh, 500 feet distance from clouds. <coughs> and you'll notice that the Vertical is always 500 feet below clouds, um, or sorry, vertically 500 feet away from clouds. So you can be above it or below it, it doesn't matter. But you need to have at least 500 feet vertical separation from the cloud. And you need to stay clear of the cloud at all times, so we cannot go and enter uh, inside of the cloud. Um, from a visibility perspective, horizontally, typically it's one mile um, not less than three miles of actual flight, sorry, uh, horizontally from cloud, we need to be at least one mile away. So that's a pretty easy one to remember where it's one mile, 500 feet. Now, if we get into uncontrolled airspace, we can get a little closer. We can get horizontally 2,000 feet from clouds. From a visibility perspective, pretty much it's three miles visibility that we need. Um, when we get into uncontrolled airspace, that can drop to as low as one mile. But honestly, when we get into those kind of conditions, we don't want to be flying. But again, for the uh, exam, you probably want to get to know these numbers a little bit. <clears throat> now, 
Now, I'm just going to touch on cars very, very briefly. <clears throat> um, this is something that you're going to have to basically spend a little bit of time with. But the Canadian Aviation Regulations, uh, the cars, these are the laws that we fly with. Um, and we need to make sure that um, we're not breaking those. And it's divided into a number of parts. So part one, part two, three, and so on. Um, the ones that you really want to look at is the 600s, okay, uh, or part six, which is the general operating and, and flight rules. Um, now, the other ones, uh, part four, for example, this covers personal licensing. You know, part five is airworthiness. So this would very much be uh, when we talk in terms of, um, you know, is your aircraft uh, airworthy, you know, things like that. Um, but the 600s is the general operating and flight rules. And you really want to spend some time around that. Um, so this is just a quick screen grab of it. Basically, go to Transport Canada, um, <coughs> tc.gc.ca, and you can read them in, in all their glory. And um, you want to spend a, a few minutes around the um, uh, the 600s. In particular, um, when we talk in terms of um, Uh, which one was it? There was a particular one that I wanted to point out. Um, airspace. So know what the different airspaces are. And then operating and flight rules. So those are going to be the, the kind of main parts that um, that are going to be what you need to, to know for the exam. Okay. Now, um, within airspeed limitations, <clears throat> I can't remember why we put this one in. So my apologies. It's not um, it's not popping into my head here why this one's here. <sighs> not more than two fifty knots if the aircraft is below ten thousand feet. <clears throat> so if you're flying a very high performance glider, I guess. Um, operating aircraft indicated not more than 200 knots. The aircraft is below 3,000 feet within 10 miles of controlled airspace. Um, again, unless you're into a very high performance airplane and you're coming into a contest finish. Um, greater the airspace referred to subsection. Yeah. And of course, uh, supersonic flight. That's going to be very important for us. All right, I'm going to move on. Okay, so we're approaching 9 o'clock here, um, and we're actually in perfect timing. want to just cover off the checklists. So um, the pre-takeoff check, sister CO. Um, for the first one, C, let me get you all to pop in your question box and type in, uh, first of all, what the C stands for. And then secondly, what are you looking for when you're doing that check? And there's two things I'm, I'm interested in. Perfect. You guys are on this all right, beautifully. So, um, the correct answer is controls, absolutely. And we're looking for proper function as well as freedom of movement. So there's two things that you want to look at. Um, is the control stick moving? Are the rudder pedals moving? You know, are they free and clear? Can I get to, as we call it, the, the four corners? <coughs> but also, is it moving in the correct direction? Now, um, this is not a positive control check. This is just a, is it free and clear? Uh, you take a quick look out on the wings. If you can, if you can scooch around enough to be able to see the tail, um, you know, is the elevator moving? Is the rudder moving? And is it moving in the correct direction? All right, I. What's I? And again, 
uh, we want to know what the, 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 the letter is as well. What are you looking for when you're checking this item? Perfect, Neil. I'm gonna I'm gonna read Neil's in answer because this one's just textbook perfect. He says instruments, instruments are on, right? So turning your master on, turning your 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 vario on. I did a flight a couple years ago where um, the student hadn't turned on his vario uh, before takeoff, and then after we release, he spent about five minutes trying to figure out how to turn on the vario, um, <clears throat> which I felt was a little. A little sad that he didn't know how to do that, so we, we had a discussion when we landed. So instruments, are they on and are they operating properly? So hence, when you're sitting on the ground, you should be seeing zero airspeed. You should be seeing, you know, kind of either a zero climb or that, that varial flipping kind of up and down a little bit. Um, and is the altimeter properly set? We had an incident a number of years ago where um, the altimeter was not properly set before takeoff. It had been set by someone on a previous flight for a guest and not reset back and um, they had turned it to zero and then they didn't turn it back to field elevation. So consequently the um, the pilot arrived at the circuit 800 feet higher than they needed to be which was a bit of a <clears throat> uh, a scary part. Um, also is the radio. Is the radio turned on? Is it at the right um, you know the right setting? All right S. So we got controls, instruments, Straps, straps, straps. Yep, you got it. And again, love Neil's answer here. Um, straps, safety straps are in place, secure for you and any passenger. Um, I'm a big fan of this. Uh, I'm encouraging students when they're flying front seat of that two-seater, you know, they're used to the, the um, instructor strapping themselves in. <coughs> Get into the habit of checking the rear seat because you're going to be flying without that instructor one day. Right? So we want to make sure that the if you are flying a two-seater, if the second seat is is secure. Right? And again, this is where your ring runner can give you a hand. Um, you know, uh, if you didn't do them ahead of time, or if the if you've got a passenger, you know, maybe the wing runner can give you a hand getting the passenger strapped in. All right, T. Trim, trim, trim. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yes, I need my weights. <laughs> yes, the the the, uh, the the lighter pilots in the group. Um, T is trim and ballast. So uh, the two of them do tie in together because, of course, that's the amount of um, uh, weight we have in the nose, which will push the nose down. Trim set for takeoff. I much prefer to say trim set for takeoff than the all the way forward, all the way aft, whatever, because it's going to be different for different airplanes. Uh, making sure that the weights are in or that the weights are out. So, you know, Karen, our nice light pilot there, she needs her weights uh, for flying, but I need to make sure that those are removed when I uh, when I take the airplane up because I'm already a, <clears throat> a little bit heavier. Um, and, you know, you can always do that quick check to make sure that the trim's functioning because, you know, as you move that, that trim setting, that stick should be moving with it. All right, R. <laughs> release, 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 yes, so give the release a quick cycle and see if it is going to, you know, if it functions, Does is there resistance, does it pop back in. If this is the first flight of the day, we want to do a release check, so we want to hook up the rope, have our ground, our wing runner pull on that rope and, <coughs> and make sure that we've got a good, um, uh, you know, good, good solid connection there. Now, um, this is a point where most people connect the tow rope. Now, we haven't completed our checks yet, and we shouldn't be connecting the tow rope until we're ready to actually lift off. Um, so one of the things that we have done at Great Lakes is uh, to change our procedure slightly that we don't actually connect the tow rope until we've closed the canopy and ready to go. All right, so we've got our, what's our second S? And again, what are the two things I'm looking for here? Mm hmm beautifully said. Closed and locked. <clears throat> All 
right? Now, here again is where our, <coughs> excuse me, here again is where our, our, our wing runner can be a good friend. Um, so when we do our spoilers check, we should open them, do a visual check, look left, look right, make sure that they're, they're open if you can see the top and bottom. Um, depending upon the aircraft, sometimes you can. Uh, make sure they're closed, make sure they're locked. <coughs> And I'm just going to pop back into, um, where the heck is it? There it is. Back into our friends at the Safety uh, Soaring Foundation. Um, and I think it's this one here. Yes, it is. It's, I know it's a little bit cheesy, but. Okay, now where is it? So th this is the scenario where he's rigging his glider and, um, the all-important tail comes in, and uh, he gets interrupted in a few moments. Before he's had a chance to properly hook it up. All right, so really, you know, kind of leading to that, that bad kind of state. and then getting to that. Now that was actually not the video I was looking for. Where was it? Ah, it's this one. <clears throat> so we're about to launch. Now in the scenario of this video, they were getting ready and someone came by and said, hey, we've got a launch opportunity. You want to hop in and go? Um, take a close look though <coughs> at this airplane. If you're the wing runner, what do you notice? Yeah, as people are chiming in very quickly, you can see the spoilers are not closed. You can see them right there. And if we let this continue to play, in this particular type of airplane, the, um, the Blanick, the spoilers will actually pull open on the airload. So you can see as he starts to get some airflow over the wings, you see those spoilers just nice and gently creep open. And Part of the reason why this is such a problem is notice he's still rolling on the ground. <clears throat> so he doesn't feel the transition of the wing flying with no spoilers to the wing flying with, with spoilers. Um, so you know what? Yeah, say something to the, the pilot. Okay. Um, so we've covered off the spoilers. Make sure they're closed and locked. Canopy is the C, closed and locked. And... Um, you know, making sure that that is is, <coughs> is done. At this point now, you should be doing the hookup. So yes, you can check your, your release earlier, um, but once you've got your canopy closed and locked, and I know on those hot days, it's very tempting to say, you know, let's keep that canopy open for as late as we can, but yep, let's get that canopy closed and locked and get this, and then do the hookup. Um, and then finally, O, Dane's already chimed in on that one. What's our O? And particularly, what are we looking for on the O? Yeah, so the correct answer here is options, and it's really about going over what we're going to do should that tow rope break. <clears throat> okay, so controls, instruments, radio, straps, trim, ballast, <clears throat> release, spoilers, and flaps, sorry, I missed that one. Canopy closed and locked, and what are our options? And options, options, options is something you should be running um, throughout the rest of the flight. You know, what, what what would happen if my rope broke now? What would happen if my rope broke now, and so on. I like to do the one, two, 300 calls. So at 100 feet, you know, where would I land? 200 feet, where would I land? And I do these actually out loud, and I do them whether or not I have someone in the cockpit with me. <laughs> so even when I fly solo, I'm still doing that. Okay, pre-release check. Now, this is one that we often don't um, really do too much with. This is the um, about to release from the tow plane. Um, and uh, what would be some of the items that we'd want to do when we 
release from the tow plane. As a release check. Okay, I remember we're actually on the tow. We're about to pull the release. Okay, so what we have here is rope away. So we pull the release. We do our right turn. We retract the wheel. We retrim the airplane, and then we locate the field. Okay, so. This is again one that it's not really that well, um, <clears throat> really that well uh, used, <coughs> but it's rope away, and it's important to call rope away because when we pull the release, we're not just you know we, we don't want to make that just a rope right turn. It's like we pull the release. No, it's rope away. We want to see that rope leave the airplane. Okay, it's very it's very visible. Uh, do our right turn, retract the wheel and uh, retrim the airplane to our new flying speed and then locate the, the airfield. Now, I want to just deal with the third R for a second, retract the wheel. Um, why do you think it's uh, a good idea to leave the wheel down during the entire tow? Let's give you some, something to think about there. So why not retract the wheel at, let's say, 200 feet or 300 feet? or even a thousand feet. Absolutely, you guys are all over this. So in case the rope breaks, in case there's trouble, it's one less thing to think about. Um, <coughs> I have seen pilots who like to retract the wheel like shortly after takeoff, and it's like, why? What are you gaining? There is also the logic that um, especially in the modern airplanes that are very slippery and very um, uh, don't require a lot of pull, uh, it's easy to get slack in the rope, and, and having that little bit of extra drag with the wheel hanging out can actually help a little bit. So I'm a big fan of, you know what, leave the wheel down until after you've released. That way, if you do have a rope break, if you do have an emergency, it's one less thing to worry about. Um, a few years ago, Jan, uh, you're like one of our, our senior members, um, he used to own a, uh, um, a, uh, a motor glider, and he had an incident where um, he got low, pulled the engine out um, to restart, and what they found, what, what happened was he had some bad fuel, and the engine started and ran rough and kind of didn't run, and then started and ran rough and things. So <clears throat> what ended up happening is he did land out, but he forgot to lower his wheel because he was distracted by dealing with the engine. So they changed their procedures then that if they're going to pull the engine out, they lower the gear first and then leave the gear out until after the engine's running and they've climbed out. So as long as the engine's out, the gear was out. Um, just that way, it's one less thing to worry about. Okay. Now the call check is one we use in the air. Um, and this is for doing height reducing maneuvers such as stalls or spins. And basically it's very simple. It's cockpit, altitude, location, and lookout. So is the cockpit secure? Are there any loose articles? Do I have enough altitude to complete the maneuver I'm about to, to attempt? <coughs> Am I in a good location, i.e. I'm not over a town or an airfield? And finally, um, you know, do your lookout, and this is where we typically do a clearing turn to make sure that there's not someone below us. All right, pre-landing check. So I'm going to get you, I'm going to quiz you guys tightly on this one, and then that'll be uh, kind of our wrap-up for today. What's the S? Straps. Yes, absolutely. Are your straps still done up? Um, you know, sometimes people like to loosen the straps off once they're up at altitude, so you want to snug them back down if they've been loosened. <coughs> Some people undo their, their um, shoulder belts to keep the lap belt going. You know, that kind of thing. What's the W? There's actually three W's. 
So I'm getting a lot of water. Yep. Wheel. Yep. And wind. Absolutely. So it's wheel, water, and wind. So lower the wheel, dump the water, and what's your wind doing? Um, now, what are the indicators that are going to tell us the direction and strength of the wind? Drift. Yay. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Trees moving, absolutely. Now, keep in mind noise. That's actually your airspeed, not where your wind. Um, the wind sock, water ripples, right? Water ripples are a great one. If you talk to Mike Ronan, he spent a lot of years flying in the bush and in and out of um, small lakes and, and rivers without wind socks. And he said, you know, all you have to do is look at a, any, any open body of water. <coughs> and you'll see... Um, the windward side is going to be smooth and the, the leeward side, so where the wind is coming from is going to be the, the smooth side and then the you know go down when it gets more bumpy. Um, you also notice it with the drift, with smoke, things like that, and of course the wind sock, but that can often be, the wind sock can be hard to see at altitude. All right, um, A. So we got straps, wheel, water, and wind. A. Oh, look at that. Airspeed, 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 airspeed. It's like you guys all copied and pasted off each other. Perfect. Now, knowing what the wind is doing, we now decide what our airspeed is for um, circuit. And you should then establish that airspeed and fly it for the rest of the flight. Again, read your, your aircraft manual. Uh, typically, we use 1.3 times wind, or excuse me, 1.3 times stall, plus the wind, plus half the gusts. On those gusty days, you want to, on those windy days, you want to bring a little bit of extra speed in because uh, you may have some wind shear. All right, F. Again, same thing. Flap, 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 flaps. Beautiful, yes. <coughs> I'm a big fan of keeping things like wheel and flaps in the checklist, even though you may be flying something like a Crosno um, or a, a Junior that has fixed undercarriage and no flaps. One day you'll move up to an airplane that has flaps and, and retractable under pitch. T. <coughs> Beautiful. Trim in traffic. Now, this one makes sense because <clears throat> you're going to trim the airplane for the new speed that you're going to fly and for the new flap setting. Because you change your flap setting, it's going to change your, your angle. Um, it's going to change your trim. Also, you want to check for traffic. Is the runway free and clear? Is there other people in the circuit? You know, that sort of thing. And what's the S? Beautiful. Again, spoilers, 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 spoilers. Now, there's a little bit of controversy when it comes to the spoilers element on this um, as to when you should check them. And being pilot in command, that's your decision. Um, I would like to recommend to you that you check the spoilers <clears throat> in a place that should they get stuck open or not come open, uh, you're able to adjust your approach appropriately. So what I like to do them is on the early part of the downwind leg. And my rationale here is that if they did get stuck open, I can always cut my circuit short and bring it in a little bit closer and tighter and do a, a, a closer, tighter circuit. Um, and if they didn't open, then I can extend my circuit and find that out, uh, or I can adjust my, my flight path appropriately. So that's my personal preference. Um, we do encourage people to do their swaths check before they get into the actual circuit itself. So when you think about the circuit and you get into that high key area, <coughs> excuse me, you get into high key, and, um, you know, that, that circuit can be very quick. Um, you know, so get your, your swaths done early, but your spoilers, I, I like to check them on the early part of my downwind. Again, make sure you've given yourself enough. Um, how about the emergency landings from Svet? And I'm not really sure what you're asking here, so I'm going to just unmute you. Where are you on the list? There you are. Sweat fan, are you there? Yeah. yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I was just wondering, in case of emergency landing, should you get distracted yourself 
with the pre-landing check or yeah, how does it work? <laughs> so your your number one priority is fly the airplane. Agreed. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if you end up bringing an airplane in and landing it safely in an emergency and you haven't done your pre-landing check, I'll give you I'll buy you a case of beer because you brought it in and landed it safely, and that's really all that matters. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, for me, this is what I would do. I, yeah. I was just asking what is the, the, the general recommendation for that, because let's I, say you thermal, and then you thermal at a very low altitude, then you stall, then you lose lots of altitude to recover, and then you realize, oh boy, I have to land. So at this point, do you really have the time to do all these checks or you just decide I'm going to land there and I'm going to land in the best way you can? Well, I, I, I would contend, first of all, that you shouldn't allow yourself to get into that situation because you shouldn't um, thermal low <laughs> to begin with. True, yeah, I know, but the, there are all sorts of scenarios, right? So, there, abs there absolutely are. Um, you know, and this is where, you know, sort of, keeping that, that awareness. So let's say we are flying cross country. So there's there's the possibility of a land out. Um, um, then, you know, what you want to be doing is when you're getting down to about 1,500 feet above the ground, when you're getting down to about 1,000 feet above the ground, um, you should have already picked your landing spots and, and be thinking about your circuit. So um, one of the dangers, of course, is if you miss a key element from this, such as your wheel, uh, you could get into a scenario where you're not doing a gear up landing and you didn't need to um, uh, okay um, you did you didn't you know you didn't lower your wheel it, it it actually you can run through them very quickly and this is where um, practice becomes really really key because the first few times that you're going to do your pre-landing checks <coughs> as a student doing their first pre-landing check I don't think I've had a single student who has started their pre-landing check at the beginning of, of, you know, downwind, completed it by the time they finished the downwind. But you get an experienced pilot now, and you can, you know, you can run through it within a few seconds. Um, so my my contention is you should do it every every landing, um, and even when I did my very very first off-field landing, which is we we're towing back, I was on a cross-country aero tow, and the rope came undone. You know, so I'm at 1,500 feet, no possibility of lift, um, and all of a sudden now I'm faced with a, you know, my very first off-field landing. I went through my checks, right? Um, I'm just going to read Paul's comment here. He says, make emergency landing into a normal landing, right? Which then goes back into, you know, what becomes an emergency landing. And, and Carrie's just chimed in our CFI. He says, an, an off-field landing is not an emergency landing. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm really kind of, you know, wondering what 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 constitutes an emergency landing, right? I mean, to me, really, the only the only time you get into a true emergency landing is if I had, uh, let's say, a passenger on board who was, you know, sick, um, <coughs> who needed to really come down quickly, um, or if I had some sort of structural failure in flight, um, at which point I would definitely want to be doing all of my checks and making sure I've gotten everything perfect. So I, I hope that answers it for you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I, I um, guessed it somewhere there. If it's all the practice, 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 I just... It is, yeah. yeah. And then uh, Carrie also chimed in. He says, you have a bunch of other checks uh, you're doing, like cows <laughs> 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 and obstructions. Right. Carrie likes to land where there's cows. He figures, you know... He, he did a, an off-field landing years ago where he loaded up his airplane with potatoes. So I guess he's got the potatoes. He's now looking for the beef. Oh, I see. All right. Okay. Um, cool. And that, that kind of brings us to our end. So I'm just going to unmute everyone. And if anyone has any questions or comments. <laughs> David, is there a way to get the information you send to us each week? Like yes. On the what, screens? I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll PDF all of the, the presentation files so that you've got all the, sli all the slides. Yeah, perfect. And send those out. Um, in the handouts area, <laughs> you'll see the airmanship um, quiz for next week. So please make sure you pick it okay. up.
and uh, if you if you're having any difficulty picking it up or anything, just fire me an email and I'll send it to you. Good. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Dave. Great presentation. All right. Thank you. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Thanks, David. All right. Take care. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. David, not too late. Uh, can I ask a question, sir? Yes, absolutely. So, in regards to the weight and balance, yes, uh, I'm just a little unclear. So, obviously, the weight is the weight of the passenger, pilot, etc. The arm is this the location of the ballast that we place from the nose? How far back from the nose we're going towards the back? To set the certain weight. Yeah, yeah, yes. you've got a local phone there. You can go call and from the local phone. The, I'm, I'm just uh, going to the mute moment. Carrie there. He's being annoying. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So the arm is the distance from a fixed reference point on the airplane to where that particular set of weight is. So hence, you notice the pilot and parachute have the same arm measurement because the parachute's mm -hmm. with the pilot, so it's in the same physical location, right? Right. Now, um, in the 126, the ballast weight is actually set in front of the stick, pretty much between your your legs, right? So it's just behind the. It's almost it's almost right where the rudders go. <coughs> so if we were to add the ballast in this equation, um, its arm would be much shorter than the 70. It would probably be something like about 30 or maybe 40 because it's, it's set substantially further forward in the airplane than the pilot is, right? Mm -hmm. And so one advantage with doing that is the further you set the ballast for, further forward, the less actual physical weight you need because it has a longer arm. Like it's, a, it's an arm that's further away from the, the center of gravity. Okay. Does that so make sense? The, and, the, and the last number, the moment number, this is the total number that we're trying to achieve, which is either higher or lower, that's going to allow us to fly the airplane. And that's a preset number for each specific airplane, correct? Correct. So the number that we're actually trying to achieve is actually the, these numbers here, which is the arm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what's going to happen is you take the weight, you multiply it by the arm, and that gives you the moment. And... <clears throat> by adding all of the moment uh, individual moment arms up, we get the overall total moment arm. And then mm -hmm. we take the total weight and divide it, and that tells us where that center of gravity is. Um, now, what we need to do is we need to have that in relation to the lift of the wing. So if you can kind of picture your airplane and you think where the wings are, right, about the thickest part of the wing is approximately where the lift goes up out of the wing, okay? okay? So if I have too much nose weight, what's going to happen is the airplane's going to want to go nose down, and then my, my elevator's going to counteract that at the back, right? right? But the elevator only has so much ability to do that. So if my weight is too far forward, the elevator can't push push down at the back enough to balance it. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and same if it's too far aft, <coughs> right? Yeah, the so, nose goes up. Exactly. Yeah. And and what happens is the airplane's designed to have a certain amount of moment arm pushing up and down in the airplane. Um, and that's what the whole C of G limits are. Makes sense. So you're basically balancing out the airplane to be in a neutral zone for, for the flight. You don't want it going yeah. forward or backwards. Just... Exactly. Exactly. And the designers have all figured this out ahead of time so that they have the right size of, of tail on it to give you enough ability to push the nose up and down based on within these limits. If you go beyond those limits, you know, you're, you're getting into an airplane that's potentially uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Dave. All right, my pleasure. We'll see you next week. We'll see you next week. Bye. Okay, ciao.